uh, I wanted to reach out to everyone and start off with that wonderful line by Friedrich Nietzsche that says, those who were seen dancing, those who were seen dancing were called insane by those who could not hear the music. Now, it actually makes perfect sense. I mean, even without envisioning a silent disco scenario where a bunch of people jumping around like maniacs are actually in the groove listening to some spectacular melodies within their consciousness. But of course, this is a line that I think applies to anybody who has been privy to startling revelations or visions that eclipse the perception of most people. All original thinkers in one way or another are called insane because those on the outside of that perimeter of consciousness, those on the outside of those of the visionary thinkers um, perspective could not hear the music. And so I think a line like that resonates. I think the reason that lines like that become bumper sticker slogans is because they're great lessons to all of us as we tread forth in our journey and our willingness to be thought ridiculous, our willingness to be thought mad, our willingness to be, again, ridiculed for having an original vision um, is where all the treasures ultimately lie. Do we have the courage to be humiliated? Do we have the courage to be laughed at? Do we have the courage to be dismissed in the name of what it is that we are pursuing? And of course, I think the cardinal rule is if you're not hurting anybody else, then you should be willing to be thought crazy. You should be dancing like nobody's watching. You should be <laughs> singing with rapture and dancing like a dervish. And I love this line. I love this line. I'm a big fan of words because I think words have the potential to encode transcendent truth, which is something that's even more deeper and more poetic than mere facts. Now, of course, the world is full of facts. We need facts for, <laughs> for making things work, of course. I get that. But Werner Herzog, the filmmaker, said that there is a dimension beyond facts. There's a sort of dimension of human experience where something closer to poetic facts lay their claims on us. Experiential poetic facts that may not have any anchors in empirical reality, but nonetheless are significant experiences that have given us glimpses of deeper and uh, ecstatic versions of the truth. So what Werner Herzog used to say was, if you're interested in facts, pick up a phone book. <laughs> it's got a bunch of names and a bunch of numbers. It's a bunch of facts, but it doesn't illuminate. So again, Werner Herzog, the filmmaker, says, if you're interested in facts, look at the phone book. It's full of facts, but it doesn't illuminate. What lies beyond is what he calls ecstatic truth. It's what perhaps only cinema or painting or music can speak to. And it is in dialogue with these ineffable poetic truths that human beings can finally feel understood. Like one of those poetic facts is what people feel when they say that they are in love. People are so certain of their feeling, even though neurologically, neurochemically, being in love is no different than taking lots of cocaine. It is a reaction, a cascade, an algorithmic cascade of dopamine and neuropinephrine. It's neurochemistry. It's a soup. It's a drug binge to fall in love. But, but that, but that drug binge of falling in love is again seen from the outside, right? It's the crazy person dancing called crazy by those who could not hear the music. Those on the outside of the enraptured chemical cascade of dopamine known as romantic love, <laughs> those on the outside of that experience will call us crazy because they cannot hear the music. And, you know, my, my interest from the beginning in making shots of awe in recording videos was that I needed evidence for myself. You know, in other words, when I was hearing the music, I knew this was ephemeral. I thought, the music is actually playing right now. I'm hearing it. To understand is to, is to perceive patterns. But 
how do I know later that this really transpired? How do you transcribe visionary insight? How do you record ephemeral epiphanies? How do you, how, yeah, how do you record music that nobody else can hear? And this is, I think, the inspiration for all poetry, for all journaling, for all ecstatic articulation and empowered vocalization. This is what makes the artist painter paint. This is what makes the singer compose. This is what makes the filmmaker write up a screenplay or make a film or the actor act. It is to convey the ineffability of the music that no one else can hear. And you know what happens? Through our art, through... Um, externalizing the contents of our consciousness, right? Because that's what cinema has always been about, right? Cinema reflects mankind's historical drive to manifest his consciousness, the music that nobody can hear outside of his mind in front of his eyes. So that all of a sudden, that music that no one can hear, the music that only we could hear, that we were called crazy, right, for hearing, when we were dancing wildly by those who could not hear the music, all of a sudden can be externalized and it becomes a common experience. Why do the videos that I make about love get millions of views? Because all of a sudden, that crazy revelry, right, that experience that I had by myself becomes a common experience that can be shared because we can behold it together. When I record a video, when a musician records his song, when a painter paints his painting, it goes from music that nobody can hear to music that we can behold together, to an experience that we can share together. And all of a sudden, subjectivity, that first person theater of our minds that keeps us often enraptured but isolated and alone can become externalized as a work project that we can all participate in and behold together, which all of a sudden anchors our experience in the desert of the real. All of a sudden we feel less alone because of it. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, I think if I didn't have my own content to bear witness to my own fleeting revelation, my ecstatic ejaculations of amazement, right? The, that, that magnificent writer was talking about his psychedelic mushroom trips and he was saying, uh, I think his, uh, Gordon Wasson was his name. He was saying that when he went down to Mexico and he took psychedelic mushrooms, he spent the next two days uttering ejaculations of amazement, uttering ejaculations of amazement to describe what he had experienced. However, I am sure that if somebody would have taken a video camera when he was in the midst of that moment that he was having without being able to hear the music that he was hearing within his consciousness, he would have seemed like a madman. Experiences from the outside are very different than experiences from the inside. And experiences from the inside, by their very nature, are private. And I think that's what art is about. Our ecstatic compulsion to express our interiority, to articulate the contents of our consciousness, is a way of evidencing that we exist. Carving our name on the tree is a way of saying, I exist, this happened, and it matters, in the words of Alan de Botton. So, mm, where does this leave us? <laughs> In the words of Jack Kerouac, it leaves us in the following uh, state. It leaves us concluding that the only people for me are the mad ones. Mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. Those who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the sky. And compound that with David Foster Wallace's idea that the alternative, my friends, is unconsciousness, right? The default setting, the rat race, that constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. 
<laughs> this is why I always say, do not go quietly into that good night, but rage, rage, and rage against the dying of the light. We must never forget, we are cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance a natural order that kills everyone.